Welcome to another episode of Gospel Eyes with Greg Steer. My name is Jason Lamb, and on behalf of the whole team here at Dare to Share, we are so glad that you're deciding to spend the next 35, 40 minutes as Greg unpacks value number six, Biblical Outcomes Measure. He's in value number six of seven values that make up this larger series of how to gospelize your youth ministry uh, in for really powerful message and truth from Greg uh, this month as he explains Biblical Outcomes Measure. It. Hey, if you want to stay up to date with what's going on with Greg and Dare to Share Ministries in addition to being subscribed to the Gospel Eyes with Greg Steer podcast, I'd encourage you to find us on social media, especially on Instagram. You can find us at Dare to Share Ministries, at Greg Steer, but follow us on Instagram. Instagram. Uh, stay up to date with what's going on here in the ministry. Again, thank you so much for tuning in. Without further ado, my good friend, Greg Steer. How to build a gospel advancing ministry, value number six, biblical outcomes measure it. Now, before you fall asleep, think about outcomes. What is an outcome and why is it important? Because Outcomes sounds a little bit boring, but it's really why we do what we do. An outcome is what comes out of your ministry. What kind of teenagers are coming out of your ministry? What kind of energy and spiritual maturity and new disciples being made and multiplied are coming out of our ministry? We do ministry because we want biblical outcomes, and we should measure them. So we're going to dive into all this, but I want to start first with uh, a passage in Mark 4, 26 through 29, where Jesus says, this is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground, night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows. The, though he does not know how, all by itself the soil produces grain, first the stock, then the head, then the full, full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts a sickle to it because the harvest has come. Now think about this, just like a farmer scatters seed and it grows and grows until it's finally mature and ready to harvest, we scatter gospel seeds and they grow and grow until we get the outcomes we've been hoping and praying for. Out of the phrases in this passage, the one I love the most is, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. We don't know exactly how the Word of God and the Gospel of Christ grow and produce fruit, but it's the power of that message, the power of the Gospel message that changes lives. It is producing fruit. It is bearing uh, fruit and producing outcomes, even when we're not around, even when we don't know about it. And what's great is it doesn't matter who scatters that seed. It could be an experienced farmer, an experienced youth leader. It could be a 13-year-old teenager all jacked up on Mountain Dew. The gospel produces results. It's intrinsically powerful, and when sown on good ground, it grows. And this growth is an outcome, and Jesus talks about it all the time. So we're going to talk about it now. I want you to be thinking about those outcomes in your ministry. What is coming out of your youth ministry? And is that the biblical outcome you've been praying for? A couple things. Number one, Jesus chose us to bear fruit. Jesus chose us to bear fruit. John 15, 16. You did not chose, choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you may go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. Jesus chose us to bear fruit. When I think of that word chosen, I think of back in elementary and middle school and high school, when you're going to play basketball or football or kickball or whatever, and they say, let's choose teams, right? And they have two team captains in the line of potential players. And I remember them just going through um, and picking people, everybody but me. I was always the second to the last, chosen, never the last, always the second to the last. You see, I'm extremely competitive and highly uncoordinated. I just am not very good at sports. I try really hard, and the more that I try, the worse that I play. And everybody knew that, uh, but I would always shame the captain, right? Before the second, I was the second to the last guy. I go, don't you dare make me the last. Not before this guy. Pick me before. And so I was always the second to the last picked, right? Here's the deal. We're always first picked with Jesus. Jesus picks us first on 
Team Jesus to accomplish something more important than scoring goals, bearing fruit. He chose us to bear fruit. A couple of things about it. Number one, it takes a lot of work. Jesus said, go and bear fruit. He chose us to go and bear fruit. In the words of Francis Schaeffer in the book, True Spirituality, this is what he calls an active passivity. We actively depend on him through the power of Jesus uh, and the power of the Holy Spirit uh, to bear his fruit through us. So we trust and obey. We yield to him and then he produces that fruit uh, through us. And it's a strange combination of faith and works. Uh, We trust in him and then he works it out through us. Paul put it this way in 1 Corinthians 15, 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. His grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. So what you see here is you see kind of the the sweat of hard labor and the dew of grace kind of intermingled into this fuel that fueled Paul. It was Christ producing that fruit through him, but he's like, man, I worked harder than anyone else. And so when we, when we trust in the Lord and we work hard and let him work hard through us, you know, we're going to bear that fruit. It takes a lot of work. Secondly, it takes a lot of time. Fruit that will last is what John 15, 16 says. God wants fruit that will last. And this kind of fruit, you only know if you're bearing fruit that will last over time. It's the long game we got to be looking at. Because sometimes in the short game, ministering with teenagers, it's discouraging. But we keep in mind that fruit that will last. We keep praying for it. We keep pushing for it. We keep working for it in the power of the Spirit. I've seen this with raising my own uh, kids. I have two teenagers. I have a 19-year-old and I have a 15-year-old. And I tell you what, what I've learned over the years, it's way more like growing a garden uh, than it is building a Lego set. You know, first on, I just thought, man, I was reading all these books. And here's what you do. It's just like Legos. You just snap these pieces together, give them a solid foundation, and you build upon that, and then you kind of form and forge the kind of team uh, that you want. What I've realized, it's more like cultivating a garden because weeds grow up. And sometimes there's hard ground that needs fertilized. And sometimes you need to prune things back. And it's an ongoing process that's seasonal, right? And it's it's not one, two, three. It is it is prayer and duct tape. It is a lot of work and a lot of prayer. What's true with me and my teens, my youth group, my in, inside my house youth group, is true of us and, and our teenagers in our youth uh, ministries. It takes time and takes effort. And sometimes along the way, it can be discouraging. Finally, it takes a lot of prayer so that Jesus in the context of bearing fruit says, so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. God guides us in the process of bearing this fruit. Uh, And he guides us through the process of prayer on how to apply God's word to specific situations. And these answered prayers are in the context of producing this fruit that will last. So Jesus chose us to bear fruit. It takes time. It takes work. It takes prayer. But you've been chosen to bear fruit in your youth ministry. So I'm going to ask you this question. How are you doing? How's how's that fruit going in the context of your youth group? Secondly, Jesus calls us to bear the right kind of fruit. Matthew 7, 17, and 18. He's talking about um, truth tellers, truth speakers, and false teachers. But we can apply this, I believe, to our youth ministries as well. Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear uh, good fruit. If you make that application to youth ministry, I mean, if if you have a bad youth ministry uh, philosophy that's not biblical, it is going to produce bad fruit. And if you have a good ministry philosophy that is biblical, it is going to produce good fruit. You know, my first encounter with uh, a tree of any kind that bore any kind of fruit, because I was a city kid, uh, was in Texas. I went there when I was 14 years old with a group of friends to haul hay for a summer. And outside of our little farmhouse, um, there was a mulberry tree. And I remember almost every night after work, climbing up in that mulberry mulberry tree and, and eating that fruit. Man, it was delicious. It was sweet. I guarantee I would not be eating that fruit if it was bad fruit, you know. It was a good tree. It produced 
good fruit. In the same way, a good youth ministry will produce good fruit. So what's the fruit of your youth ministry? Is it good fruit or bad fruit? Good fruit. Are your teens on fire for God? Do, do your teens know what they believe and why they believe? Are they inspired and equipped to make and multiply disciples? Or is it bad fruit? Is it full of entitled teenagers who are apathetic in their faith? Teenagers who kind of make God a spoke of their wheel instead of the hub of their wheel? Is it full of teenagers who know the truth but deny the power thereof by living a worldly life? <laughs> Good fruit or bad fruit? The strength of the roots determine the quality of the fruit. Let me say that again. The strength of the roots determine the quality of the fruit. This is a word we're going to use called qualitative. It's the quality. To use the, the, the fruit analogy, uh, nobody I know likes to eat mushy, bruised apples. We always like to eat crisp, delicious apples, right? We want the quality of that fruit. So what's that quality? Daniel Henderson <coughs> put it this way. If we long to see the supernatural fruits of revival, we must first do the work of developing the life-giving roots of revival. <coughs> Sorry. So let's talk about what some of those roots are, but first let's talk about what those uh, fruits will look like. And there's a passage in Scripture that I believe is given to us that has great metrics of what uh, quality fruit is, that qualitative uh, outcomes we want to see. It's Hebrews chapter 5, verses 11 through 14. And nobody really knows who the writer of the book of Hebrews is, but whoever the writer is, uh, he or she are going on and on about Melchizedek, and he wants or she wants to kind of dive deeper into this subject, but out of frustration, they stop because they feel like they've reached their limit of what these Hebrew believers can understand because of their spiritual maturity level. So they write this, We have much to say about this, but it's hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone else to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Boy, can't you just hear yourself saying that to a youth group? right? It's like right in the middle. It's like, I want to go deeper in this stuff, but you're clueless. You should be teaching this stuff by now. You can just hear the frustrated youth leader in the voice of the writer of Hebrews. But what are those metrics? What are those outcomes of quality fruit? You can kind of see it through these uh, direct rebukes of the writer of Hebrews. Number one, the first uh, result of being spiritually mature, that quality fruit is a hunger to understand the Bible. The writer says, you no longer try to understand. So the opposite is true. It's in a student that is growing in their faith, maturing in their faith, quality fruit, there is a desire to understand God's word. There's a spiritual hunger. What's that spiritual hunger level of your students in your group? That's a biblical outcome. I think of my uh, son's girlfriend, Kaylee, pretty new believer, doesn't know a lot of theology, but is learning and very hungry to learn. And we were driving back, all of us, on a kind of a family trip to southern Colorado to see the great sand dunes. And in the midst of this conversation, <coughs> we're talking God and theology. My son goes, uh, hey, Dad, tell Kaylee about the end times. And so I start telling her about the end times and the Lord coming back and all this stuff. And I'll never forget her response. She goes, Oh, crap, i got to reach my whole family, all my friends, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm like, that there, right there, is the purpose of prophecy, to inspire us. But she's always got questions. She's hungry to grow. And that's actually a sign of good fruit. Where are your students when it comes to that? Do they have a hunger to grow in truth? Secondly, a passion to proclaim the truth. The writer goes on, by this time you ought to be teachers, <clears throat> you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's Word all over again. In a sense, every spiritually mature person is a teacher. Whether it's one-on-one -on -one or one with many, as we grow in God's Word and grow in maturity, we share God's truth with those who are less mature. 
In a sense, evangelism is a form of teaching. You're teaching someone the truth about the gospel. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, you all should be teaching, but instead you're just listening to the same old stuff over and over again, and you're not growing. You ever feel like that with your students? You go over it again and again and again and again, and you just get rolling eyes and heavy sighs, and they're not getting it. You want to see that passion to grow, but also to proclaim the truth. Thirdly, a thirst to go deeper with the Lord. The writer writes to the Hebrew believers, you need milk, not solid food. You guys should be hungry for the deeper, hungry for the deeper things of God, but you're not. <coughs> I have to give you milk, not solid food. Because you don't give a baby a T-bone steak, right? Uh, you don't give an adult a, 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 a baby bottle with formula in it. You, you want to give those who are maturing meat. And the more our kids grow in Christ, the more they have that desire uh, to dive deeper into theology and truth. Let me just put this as a by the way. If you get your kids sharing their faith, you get them articulating the gospel, you're going to see in them a hunger to know more theology. Because they want to know, why can we trust the Bible? Because I'm sharing that it's truth. Or how do we know Jesus was God? You know, what about the Trinity? You're going to dive into all sorts of theological truths as you get them to share their faith. <coughs> the fourth uh, outcome of this qualitative, a good kind of fruit is an attitude of dependence on the Spirit. The writer of Hebrews says, anyone who lives on milk being still an infant is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. What is this teaching about righteousness? I believe uh, this teaching about righteousness, based on the context of the book of Hebrews, is that we are made right, we grow in our righteousness, not by the list of righteous things that we do as believers, but by depending on the righteousness of Christ. And when his righteousness flows through us because we are living in dependence on the Spirit, then we're walking in rest and spiritual maturity, and the fruit of the Spirit is flowing through our lives. Basically this, do your kids look at the Christian life as a list or as a love relationship that flows out of Christ through them? We want to give them the teaching about righteousness. That's a sign of maturity when they're, they're, they're not gauging their spiritual growth by a list of do's and don'ts, but by Christ in them and through them. And finally, a perspective of discernment from the Father. It says the mature, again in Hebrews, the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. So a maturing teenager, the right kind of outcome, <coughs> knows how to discern right from wrong on their own. And that is because they've constantly trained themselves to do that. Now, to illustrate this, <clears throat> years ago when we did these Dare to Share conferences, I was talking about media and media discernment to teenagers and, and how do you know what you can uh, listen to? How do you know um, what you can watch in a movie or, or, or whatever? How, what's that discernment look like? And I gave the illustration of a red monk and a blue miner. And the red monk basically just is red because the red monk says, no, everything that is from the world, a movie or any secular song, um, any TV show done by the world is wrong. It's a sin. Uh, that's why the monk says no, right? The blue minor is that philosophy, like Paul said in Acts 17, um, when he quotes the pagan poet, so he'd obviously mine through a bunch of pagan poetry to find one golden nugget of truth that he could deliver to the men of Athens. You know, so you got to know the first John 2, do not love the world, anything uh, of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And then you got the minor, you got Acts 17, where Paul is quoting a pagan poet and obviously was somewhat familiar with their poetry. So which is right? I asked the students, when it comes to music and media and, and movies, who's right? The red monk or the blue minor? How many of you guys think the red monk is right? The red monk that just says no. And of course, uh, all the homeschool kids and many of the Christian school kids, you know, yeah. And what about the bl blue miner? You know, you can dig through the garbage to get the one nugget of truth. How many of you guys think they're right? Most of the other kids are like, yeah, the, the you know, the blue miner. And, and I said, here's the deal. Both are right and both are wrong, depending on the scenario. So I said, I want you to look at your playlist uh, in, in your song list and see, see those songs and, and ask yourself, what if Jesus was here? What would he think of each of these songs? Or what would he think of the movies that you watch? Because you put the color blue 
and red together, you get the color purple. And purple represents the color of majesty. And we'll call it representing the color of King Jesus. So it's King Jesus' presence in our lives that determine what we should monk, say no to, and what we should mine, what we should dig through to get a truth out of. So really helping our kids to discern good from evil in a non-legalistic way, that red monk and blue miner is a simple way to do that. And again, discernment is a outcome of spiritual maturity. So we've talked about this qualitative growth, our students growing deeper in their faith. <coughs> what about quantitative? Because our third and final point is this, Jesus challenges us to bear much fruit. He wants us to bear much fruit. John 15, 8, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. God wants more than faithfulness. He wants fruitfulness. And I know sometimes we hear it the other way. It's like, it doesn't matter that, you know, d don't worry about producing fruit. Just be faithful. Uh, and as long as you're faithful. But you know what? The Bible really makes it clear. He wants us to be faithful, but he also wants us to be fruitful. This is to our my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. And if you're not bearing much fruit, then maybe we're not being as faithful as we think we are. And I understand there are settings where it's harder to produce spiritual fruit. I understand in some Muslim countries it's difficult. And there's a, but I believe also at the same time the power of the gospel changes lives and the power of prayer works. And when we're faithful, we're going to over time see the fruitfulness that we may never have expected. Sometimes I think people use that as a smokescreen for, for not really working hard enough or strategically enough or taking a look uh, at, their, at their model or their mindset and they just say, well, I'm just being faithful. Well, maybe you're being faithful in a model that's not biblical. So we need to think through those hard questions because Jesus challenges us to bear much fruit. First of all, in our lives, we must bear much fruit in our lives. We all know this, Galatians 5, and 23. Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. The fruits of a godly life in our own lives. We need to continue to bear much fruit uh, when it comes to the fruit of the Spirit. Secondly, we must bear much fruit in our ministries. <coughs> so I want to make a couple things clear. Number one, when I talk about bearing fruit in our ministries, I'm talking about numbers. People get nervous when I talk about numbers, but I remind them there's a whole book in the Bible called Numbers. It has nothing to do with my point, but it's just kind of interesting. All right, but the right numbers matter. The right numbers. William Bruce Cameron once said this, not everything that can be counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted. So it's got to be the right numbers. So many times we're thinking about the numbers of attendance. And I'm not saying that's not a metrics that doesn't matter at all, but it, based on everything we've seen at Dare to Share, they are not the attendance is not the, the best number for us to gauge our effectiveness. So the right numbers matter. And let me just make this clear before I dive into this. The right numbers matter to God. Matthew 25, 24 through 27 he also had one uh, who had received the one talent came forward saying, oh, so we know this story about the one, the servant that received 10 talents and produced 10 more. Uh, one received five talents, produced five more. And then there's one who received one talent. It says he also had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours, but his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew I had uh, reaped where I had not sown and gathered where I had scattered no seed, then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and in my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. In other words, I gave you something, you didn't, you didn't invest it, you didn't multiply it, you didn't add to it, uh, you didn't bear fruit with it, and he calls him a wicked and lazy servant. So we need to be careful uh, and really make sure that we are bearing fruit for the glory of God because he wants us to bear this fruit, but the right kind of fruit. So what does that look like? N number one, the right numbers reflect the right kind of growth. What specifically 
can we begin to measure when it comes to these numbers? Well, I think an easy one is the number of annual baptisms uh, of your teenagers. And I, I don't want to get into modes of baptisms. I know some dunk, some sprinkle, some send them down a slip and slide. I don't, I don't think they do that, but I just say that because it sounds funny. Um, but however you do that, uh, baptism is a great way. Why? Because it's the original way of measuring effectiveness. Acts 2.41, those who received his word were baptized. They were added uh, that day about 3,000 souls. So 3,000 people who responded to the gospel and were immediately baptized. Baptisms are a really solid way to quantify the right kind of growth. And I know a lot of times when it comes to youth ministry and teenagers, some youth leaders are like, well, that's maybe when they're older or let, let their parents uh, drive in. I encourage you to lean in that. And again, different churches have different kind of standards and different, you know, procedures for that to happen. But bring it up because baptism is a great way to track growth. The great thing about a baptism is you do that publicly. When you do that publicly, I mean, I, I think it really seals and steel, steals, S-T-E-E-L, that decision in the heart of those being baptized. So it's an easy way to track growth. Another way, another uh, outcome is number of gospel conversations. Acts 19.10, this went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. And so th this is basically um, people that have been trained by Paul and spreading out from the school of Tyrannus and spreading the gospel, having gospel uh, conversations. And so how many people have heard uh, the word of the Lord? Every person in this area heard the word of the Lord. So if there were 100,000 people in the province of Asia, 100,000 people heard the gospel of Christ. We have a lot of youth leaders that dare to share that kind of measure number of gospel conversations. By the way, I just tie this in now. If you're here and you don't know that gospel, I've been talking about it. God created you to be with him. He loves you so much. But our sins, they separate us from God because he's a perfect and holy God. And we all sin. We all fall short. We miss the mark. We, we want to be back with him. But those sins, they cannot be removed by good deeds. So religion doesn't cut it. So Jesus came and died. He paid the price for our sin on the cross, rose again. He died in our place, and if we trust in him alone, we have eternal life, and it begins now and lasts forever. And if for some reason you're listening to this podcast, you've never put your faith in Christ, today is a day of salvation. Trust in him uh, right now. Another, another outcome is this, percentage of new conversion growth. It says, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So what does this mean? What percentage of your youth group came to Christ through your youth group? So in early church, uh, people were reaching their family, friends, and neighbors. And you can, in the same way, our, our teenagers uh, are reaching, hopefully, their classmates, their teammates, their family, their friends. And your youth group is growing as a result. I've used this illustration uh, many times before, but it really makes the point. If you have a youth group of 200 uh, uh, down the street, and down the other street you have a youth group of 20, at first glance, the youth group of 200 looks way more effectively uh, effective when it comes to outcomes because there's 200 kids when it comes to evangelism. But let's say 10 of those kids came to Christ from students reaching students. Okay? Let's say the youth group of 20 doesn't look quite as effective, but 10 of those students came to Christ from students reaching students. The youth group of 20 is like 10 times more effective than the youth group of 200 when it comes to evangelism. So percentage of new conversion growth uh, is, a, is a great uh, tracking. And finally, percentage of teens actively uh, sharing the gospel. I love Acts 4.31. After they prayed, the place where the meeting was shaken, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. They had a 100% participation rate, right? 100% prayed, 100% filled with the Spirit, 100% spoke the word of God boldly. I think if you had 100% of your kids actively sharing their faith, the result that, that flowed out of a Spirit-inspired prayer meeting on a consistent basis, that's a good sign. But maybe it's 10% right now. Maybe it's 5%. Maybe it's 0%. Well, start with you, right? Start you actively sharing your faith and get those other students doing it. Begin to build those biblical outcomes. So you may be thinking, man, this is kind of blowing me away because there's a lot of stuff you're telling me I'm chosen to bear fruit, that I'm not just running a program. I am, I am, I'm 
I'm making a garden. I'm growing a garden. And if I want to honor the Father, I need to produce fruit, but also most uh, much fruit. Not only that, I, I want a quality of fruit. I want students that are growing deep in their faith, they're hungry for the Lord, they're, they're teaching, they're not, they're not satisfied with milk, they want to go deep. Uh, I want students who are able to discern, uh, to, to really recognize the presence of Christ in their life and make strong uh, choices. But I also want quantity. I want to bear much fruit. And I want, to, I want to measure the right things like new conversion growth and number of baptisms and what percentage of my kids are actively sharing their faith. <coughs> and that's a lot of stuff. And, or maybe you've been doing it for a while and you're not seeing those results. <coughs> I want to encourage you with Galatians 6, 9. Another uh, harvest verse. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. If you apply the seven values in your ministry and you're fueled by the Spirit and you're patient, over time, God's going to produce a harvest, even if you don't see it right away, in the next month, even in the next six months. Over time, you're going to build a harvest. And maybe even years later, you'll see the impact that God used you to do. I was at uh, Winter Jam uh, just over a week ago in Atlanta or in Nashville. And there when I was in Winter Jam, uh, after I preached, I met a guy named Tommy Prophet. And I was talking to him, and he goes, are you Greg Steer? And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, I heard your voice when you were up there preaching. He was kind of backstage with the art, musicians and artists. He goes, I can't believe you're still doing Dare to Share. And I'm like, okay. Uh, and he's like, 20-plus years ago, uh, I was in Detroit, and every year uh, our youth leader took us to Dare to Share. And we went out sharing our faith. And it challenged me to trust in the Lord, and it stretched my faith. And when we got back, I said, we got to keep doing this because this is what we're called to do. He goes, I just want you to know it had such an impact in my life uh, as a teenager that it's still reverberating today. And I'm like, what do you do today? He goes, I'm a producer and a writer. And I go, for who? And he goes, NF. I'm like, what? The NF, like the rapper guy? He goes, yeah. And I go, Wow. Um, he goes, he's my best friend and a solid believer. And um, I just want you to know that what you did back then impacts how I live my life today. And I just want to thank you and just keep doing what you're doing. Don't give up on teenagers. It was so, so encouraging. Uh, and then I told him, hey, tell NF it's going to work out. He's always sad in his raps. It's going to work out just fine. And he laughed because I was kind of joking. Anyway, but... The bottom line is, you may, be, you may be discouraged because you're in the midst of it. Just like 20 plus years ago, I was in the midst of doing conferences in Detroit and grinding and wondering, is this really making a difference? But it could be, it could be decades later. Usually it's not days later. It's sometimes decades later. You'll be able to see the impact that you made. And even if you don't, someday on the other side of eternity, you're going to hear story after story of the impact that you made seeking to produce this fruit, bear much fruit. He chose us to bear this fruit. And on that great day of celebration at the marriage feast of the Lamb, we're going to see all that God accomplished through us. So let's go for it. Let's bear much fruit for the glory of God. Father, strengthen these youth leaders. Help us to measure the right things and help us to produce those uh, outcomes you want. And we ask that you, through your Spirit, produce them in us and through us and our students. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Greg, for another amazing episode of Gospel Eyes with Greg Steer. My name is Jason Lamb. I'm here with my good buddy, John Burdett, who is a new face and a new friend. I'm not on Carrie. The block. You are not <laughs> Carrie, brother. You are not Carrie. Uh, John is a dear friend, has been a gospel advancing leader in local churches for years now, and just six months ago actually joined our team on staff yeah. here uh, within our mobilization division. And so it's just an awesome honor uh, yeah. to, and privilege to get to work with a good buddy and excited that this is your first time 
time helping with the podcast, yeah, man. So welcome. So happy to be on board. Yeah. Well, well most days I am too. <laughs> <laughs> here, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's awesome to get yes. to do ministry with you, man. Uh, okay, so I, I know you've been a subscriber to the podcast. Yeah. You've listened to it faithfully through all the episodes, especially around this series. But yeah. tell me, what was your biggest takeaway from what Greg shared regarding biblical outcomes? Yeah, you know, it was all good stuff. But the thing that really just jumped out at me was that it's not just about being faithful. It's faithful and fruitful. Fruitful, Either yeah. or, but both and. And when you think about being fruitful, first it starts with our personal lives. We really need to examine mm-hmm. our own lives and and, you know, what kind of fruit, kind of do a little fruit inspection of what kind of fruit God is producing. How fruity producing. are you? Yeah, how fruity are you? Exactly. And how are we letting the Spirit produce that fruit in our lives? And so with the, the fruit of the Spirit being love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, gentleness. and self-control, we could sing the song together. But no. you know, to actually, have, that's an ongoing rhythm that we need to have just as totally. followers of Christ, not just as leaders, as followers of Christ, and examining the fruit that's being produced in our lives. And then right. on to ministry, just the whole thought of what Greg said was really in your face, but it's so powerful and true is that, you know, if you're being faithful as a leader, but never seeing fruit, mm. could it be that you're being faithful in a, in a model that's not biblical? Sure. And I know that can step on our toes, but again, with examination, to take a moment and just step away and just examine our ministry. Is it, is it lined up with scripture? Is it lined up with what Jesus teaches and the Bible teaches? Absolutely. Well, yeah. if biblical outcomes measure and, and we're following Christ mm-hmm. in how we live our lives, but how we lead our ministries and as we're faithful, and, and it may take a season, it may take some time, but yeah. we should expect that God will be faithful in that as well and yes. that we will begin to see that fruit. I think the struggle for a lot of youth leaders, and it was for me for several years being a youth pastor in the local church, um, it, it wasn't a question of, of faithfulness. I think, I think yeah. most youth leaders, if not all youth leaders out there want to please the Lord. Yeah. They want to minister to students. And, and there is that desire to see fruitfulness. But then it really becomes a question of, well, what are we measuring? Exactly are we right. measuring the right kind of numbers? That was the biggest takeaway mm-hmm. for me. Greg talked about, yeah, we need to be about the numbers, but we need to be about the right kinds of numbers. It's yeah. not just about the attendance right. and how many kids are coming out on Wednesday night or Sunday morning or how many events you're doing. But there are biblical outcomes we can measure with those students who are showing up to right. youth group and do those events. Uh, how many of them are memorizing scripture? How yeah. much scripture have they memorized? How many of our students can articulate the gospel? How many of them are actually sharing the gospel with their friends? Are we seeing baptisms in our youth ministry yeah. and how many and, and beginning to measure those things that, because those are the ultimate yes. things that we're working toward and those are the right kind of numbers and the biblical outcomes that we need mm-hmm. and desire to see, but it does take sometimes reorienting and refocusing totally. around the right kind of numbers. That's right, and you, you think about tips that we can really pull from this too, uh, just in my time in ministry. As a matter of fact, I've, I've applied these gospel advancing values both as a youth pastor and a lead pastor mm-hmm. as well, just seeing God do remarkable things. And so really one thing about uh, measuring is on the front side of that is setting goals. And sometimes right. if we're honest leaders, we struggle with setting goals because why? We're afraid we won't attain them. Right. And so as we start to measure them, so, but you know, there's that old saying, if you, if you aim at nothing, Thing, you're sure to hit it. And I think one of the things that scares us a lot of times is, well, what if I set a goal and we don't hit it? And I think what we have to focus on is is, is that's where God's faithfulness comes in. And right. we're being faithful and He does, he's the one that brings the increase, but we're sowing the seed. And so we may not always hit the goal exactly the way we think or want, right. but we have progressed much farther than we ever would have just because of the seed that's that's been cast and the fruit that's coming out of that. And so I, I think about that part of it. And also think about celebration as a huge, whether it's baptisms that you're measuring or new mm. conversion growth or gospel com- conversations or all the above, right. uh, celebrating those as they happen. And then also setting so- a t- aside some time like monthly to celebrate and even having a big annual celebration because as it's also been said, what gets celebrated gets replicated. And it Absolutely. just kind of begins to create that culture and more and more students and leaders will come on board yeah, and I think ministry. as we keep our eye on biblical outcomes, setting numbers, yes, can be a good thing. And, and John's right. Those don't become defeating. So if, if you set a goal of 50 gospel conversations this month right. and your students have 42, yeah. like nobody's going to be upset about that. Your kids had 42 gospel conversations, but sometimes by having that carrot out yeah. in front of you gives you something to strive for. Yes. But it's are you measuring the right things? I know in, in, in our student ministry when I was in Tennessee, when we would see students put their faith and trust in Christ, we, I would pick up white helium balloons on the way to Sunday morning and we would hang white 
light balloons on the yeah. stage in our youth room to celebrate that we'd seen students come to faith. And then on Baptism Sunday, we'd yeah. do the same thing with blue balloons. Mm. For the students, we did a different shade of blue for anybody who got baptized to celebrate as a whole church. That's but, awesome. I mean, we threw like a birthday party on Baptism Sundays. We, we got the it. cake, the punch. We rolled it out because we wanted yeah. to celebrate what God was doing. It is we a party. Celebrating. Yeah. yeah, we were having a party about those biblical outcomes that we wanted to build That's excitement awesome. around and see replicated ongoing in our ministry that's, for sure that's great stuff brother and then as we look at the tools some things that you can practically uh use and apply when it comes to measuring biblical outcomes well i can think no greater uh, no greater one than the gospelized book, book. Man, i know this is the gospelized podcast yeah. but uh, gospelize your youth ministry that greg steer wrote as a powerful game-changing book and really it really does a good job breaking down value number six in terms of what's an input what's an output and then what we're really trying to go for and measure is an outcome, outcome biblical outcomes. does a great job you should check that out. As a matter of fact, it's uh, the e-copy of that. You can download the e-version of that by just going to our website at daretoshare.org. Or we got a little bit of And it's price. free. It is so free. So you can download it, but it's totally no free. Yeah. Right. And if, if you're more of you want a physical copy, uh, we're going to do a little, little contest here for the... Contests are just... Email us. Just email us. Just it's email not even us. really that big of a deal. Yeah. So podcast at daretoshare.org. The first three that email us at that address podcast at daredestare.org we will send you a free physical copy of the book gospelize your youth Absolutely. ministry I, another tool that, that we want to hit on and greg has mentioned a few times on the podcast but dare to share live this year is mm. coming up on october 10th 2020 uh this day is designed and built around generating biblical outcomes yes. in your youth ministry and so your students are going to get trained and equipped in sharing the gospel they're going to have gospel conversations that day uh, you will see students come to faith through that outreach experience and through them texting yes. their friends and, and so if this is something you're like we need to embrace this we need to start turning the corner really simple then is is get registered for dare to share live um partic- plan to participate on october 10th but but that day as a whole is designed again to gen- generate biblical outcomes in your ministry and so it's an easy first step and one that we would love for you to take with us hey thanks again for for dialing in and and tuning in for this episode of gospel eyes with greg steer on behalf of john and myself and the whole team yeah. here at dare to share god bless you guys uh we pray for you we thank god for you until every teen Everywhere, here's the gospel from a friend. Amen.